So hello and welcome to our second session for Claris Engage Beyond. I'm Janine Campbell and I am your host for today's session uh, featuring Wim DeCourt of Soliant Consulting, all about Claris FileMaker Server for Linux. Uh, before we get started, let me just walk through some general technical support and housekeeping details. If you require support from WebEx at any time, we've included the WebEx technical support information in the chat. It's also up here on the screen. Please, if you need technical assistance, contact them in your region as appropriate. We recommend you participate with your computer audio, but you can dial in if that is better based on your bandwidth. Simply select the three dots at the bottom of the window and choose your audio connection. Also, if you can shut down any other applications that draw bandwidth, it will uh, create a better experience while viewing today's WebEx. Also, questions. I want to make sure that everyone understands uh, questions and how to customize your viewing experience. You can customize what you see and how the presenters are displayed. Simply click Layout, and there are several options there. Um, so feel free to select the options that are best for you and your viewing experience. And now moving on to questions specifically, we will have time for some live Q&A. And uh, Wim will take some questions as well as some special guests. So hang out to see who else might join in in that Q&A section. To submit your question, we ask that you please open the Q&A panel and send your question to all panelists. And we will um, answer as many questions as time allows at the conclusion of Wim's presentation today. And so with that, I am happy to, um, oh, one more thing. Gosh, how could I forget? We've also created a dedicated space on the Claris community for you to uh, engage in continued questions after today's event. We will answer some questions over the next several days in that space, and we want to facilitate good conversation there. So feel free to bookmark this link to the uh, question section on community specific to this session on Server for Linux. OK, now I'm ready to pass the virtual microphone to Wim DeCourt of Soliant Consulting. Wim, take it away. Thank you, Janine. Uh, my name is Wim de Court, and uh, happy to be here. Uh, hello to everybody. Um, I am the director of the Claris practice at Sloan Consulting Inc. Um, and uh, what, does the, what that does basically it means that I uh, have the pleasure of leading a, a very talented uh, FileMaker developer team of about 32 strong at Sloan Consulting. It, it's worth to note as well that Sloan Consulting is a fully employee-owned company, and we're, we're kind of proud of that. I have been active in the uh, FileMaker Claris community from day one, and for me that was over 25 years ago. Um, if you haven't been in the community or active in the community, there's a couple of forums. Uh, there's community.claris.com that you can go to, and you'll find that it is a very close-knit and very friendly uh, environment. It's actually when I got started 25 years ago, it's how I learned all my early skills. Um, and uh, you'll find me there. I'm paying it forward. There are some great people out there uh, that can help you through your early learning curve, or even with some very advanced topics. I have a, a today, actually, this year marks the 20th anniversary of my first uh, DEF CON speaking engagement that was at a DEF CON in Orlando. Um, since then, I've spoken at most of the past 20 DEF CONs, and it's always an honor to do so. Um, if you go back in history, you'll find that most of my sessions deal with security considerations, integrations with other applications, and server deployments. And that's exactly what we will do today. We will talk about FileMaker Server that runs on Linux. And when we say FileMaker Server, we really mean the FileMaker Server that you install on-premise or that you install in the cloud yourself, right? It's separate from FileMaker Cloud, which at the core of FileMaker Cloud is also a FileMaker Server, and it also runs on Linux. But FileMaker Cloud is a, is a different product. It's a whole product that includes managed hosting, a customer console, identity provider, all of that good stuff. So we will talk mainly about what we call Claris FileMaker Server, uh, the one that you install yourself. And the main point that we want to talk about today is why do you, why would you care about the, having a Linux version of FileMaker Server um, and how do you go about using it? A Linux version of FileMaker Server isn't entirely new, right? So it's been around it's coming up to its first anniversary, actually. Um, it was released back in October, November of 2020. But even before that, um, it was already used in the Claris FileMaker Cloud product, right? So that one has been running on Linux for quite a while, for a number of years. So it's not an entirely new thing. It's just something that has been added to our arsenal. It's now something that we can install ourselves, whether it's on-premise or, or self-cloud hosted. 
And what it means is that we really have four deployment options right now, right? So we have our three versions of Claris FileMaker Server, the ones that we can install ourselves, and we have Claris FileMaker Cloud that we can buy into and have that fully managed hosting done by Claris. There are some subtle uh, technical differences or functional differences between uh, these four deployment choices, and we'll get into some of that uh, further down in the presentation. The first release of uh, the FileMaker Server for Linux uh, was built for the CentOS operating system. So that was the one that was released with 19.1.2 uh, and then updated to 19.2. Uh, um, and recently, with the release of 19.3, Claris has made the switch to Ubuntu. Um, so any uh, that current version that we have now, 19.3, and any uh, new version that we will have in the future will be Ubuntu-based and not CentOS-based. So let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, there has been a lot of talk and confusion early in the, in the year about CentOS and, and what felt like the demise of CentOS. So let's dive into that a little. Uh, Red Hat had basically four operating systems in their Red Hat arsenal. Um, and roughly from left to right, as you see on the screen there, is how changes to the operating systems get incorporated in every different version of those operating systems that they have, right? So all the way at the left is Fedora, Fedora always gets the newest changes, the, the new shiny bits. Um, when they get vetted, they make their way into CentOS 3 and before they make them into the enterprise product, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And then when the old CentOS was still around, only then would the changes be incorporated in CentOS. So what Red Hat has decided to do is to scrap the tail end of that. So CentOS at the tail end is no longer. Um, and CentOS Stream is, is still there. And, there isn't really a big difference in operating system between CentOS Stream and CentOS. It's just that the old CentOS got all the changes last. And that meant that as an operating system, it was a very conservative operating system, right? Because before any changes were made there, they went through a long vetting process in all of the other operating systems. And that's exactly what people want in an operating system, a server operating system, right? They want stability. It's got to be a boring thing that you can just fire up and it'll keep on ticking. It keeps on running. So when Red Hat announced that they would scrap the CentOS in favor of CentOS Stream, basically making CentOS from ultra conservative to a lot less conservative, it caused a lot of confusion and angst uh, about the potential stability in the future. So Claris made the right move in going away from that and picking CentOS, uh, sorry, and picking Ubuntu for the new versions. And that's not the only reason for the switch, right? Ubuntu is also uh, by a wide margin, the more popular platform. And there are some future benefits that we'll get to later in this presentation as well, and that will hook back to the keynote. Um, if you if you watch the keynote, you'll recognize that one of the reasons why uh, Ubuntu is a better choice than CentOS for some of that future stuff. When you look at the supported versions of those two operating systems, you'll note that they are not the most recent recent versions of these, right? So for Ubuntu, it's 18.04, and for CentOS, it's 7.8 and 7.9. Uh, so those are not the most recent releases of those operating systems. And again, that's for reasons of being conservative. Um, you want to pick the version that is vetted, that has been around for a long time. Uh, all the bugs have been shaken out, or at least all, all of the, the early child bugs have been, have been shaken out. And although they are not the most recent versions of those operating systems, it does mean that they're the old versions of the operating systems, right? So uh, for instance, if we take Ubuntu 18.04, the, the most recent release of that one dates back to August 2020, so it's about a year old, and it gets frequent updates. And it will get updated, uh, it, it will receive updates for quite a few years to come, I believe until 2023. And even CentOS, uh, CentOS 7, uh, will get maintenance updates all the way to mid 2024. Right? So they're not old, they're stable, they're conservative, and that's exactly what we want in a server operating system. So why would you care about having a FileMaker server that runs on Linux? And there's a couple of really good reasons why. Um, and you see them there on the screen. And the, the first one is kind of obvious, right? It's a license-free operating system. That means there's no cost to it. So that makes it very appealing to use. And also, IT departments absolutely love it, right? It's a favorite server operating system uh, uh, that IT departments really want us to use. And then it's stable, reliable, and secure. It's considered uh, all of those things. And because it's a lightweight operating system, 
it's also very easy to automate. Um, so there's a lot of stuff you can do from automated deployments to automated updates, uh, automatically installing FileMaker server, spinning one up to run the data migration tool. There's a bunch of stuff that you can automate around Linux as an operating system. And then if we take a brief glimpse into the future, and that's the tie into the keynote that we uh, just came out of, um, containers, dockers, right? that, that was mentioned in, in the keynote, and Ubuntu is a great operating system to allow for that. Right? So the ability to run FileMaker Server as an appliance, even on-premise, because by and large, right, that's what FileMaker Cloud already does, right? You just sign up, um, you get a console, and everything's running. You don't have to install an operating system. It just is uh, available to you. So the ability to do the same thing on-premise uh, as a turnkey deployment, uh, that'll come in the form of, um, of containers, Kubernetes or Docker. Um, there's a couple of different options there. And there are already some people in our community that are exploring that. And we at Solion are also keeping our finger on the pulse with this one, because that's uh, one of the major ways that FileMaker servers will be deployed in the, in the future as one of the options. There are also a couple of wrong reasons to pick Linux, and we want to dispel some possible erroneous assumptions that people can make around Linux. And the first one is that because it's Linux, it's going to be fast, right? So. And with that assumption, you'd say, well, I will always pick Linux, because if I have to pick or make a choice between Linux, Mac OS, and Windows, Linux is going to beat the pans out of the other ones. Um, and that is not so. Um, uh, the operating system itself is not going to move the needle to that extent as the assumption uh, may want us to believe, right? It is the nature and the design of our solutions, by and large, that is going to drive how fast it behaves on any server. What we're looking at here on the screen is output from a, a tool called Punisher. It's a tool that we developed at Solion. It's available for free on GitHub. You can download it. And what the tool allows us to do is to test different versions of FileMaker Server on the same machine, or test uh, the same version of FileMaker Server across different machines, and gauge the impact of what either the machine or the FileMaker Server version does, or the operating system in this case, does for the typical operations that we all have in our solutions, right? It does about 16 different tests from creating records, updating records, leading records, sorting records, um, doing big loops and iterations. So doing things that are computationally expensive, import, export. So all the things that we have in all of our solutions is what Punisher tests. So what we see here on the screen is the big columns are the operating systems. The 1, 5, 10, 20 is the load, the, the number of concurrent sessions that are running on that server at the time of measuring. The white cells are basically the number of seconds it takes to run to any of these particular tasks. And I have listed only four, not the full 16 there, um, to maintain a little bit of um, visibility on, on, that, on that chart there so you can wrap your brain around it. What we see here are four typical operations. And as you can see, if you look at that, between the different operating systems, these tasks are roughly all the same, right? So some oper operating systems do the task a little faster but on the aggregate, if you look at all the tasks across all the operating systems, the operating system or the choice of operating system doesn't really make a lot of difference. The second myth that we want to dispel is that because Linux typically allows us to run on all the hardware, uh, much older hardware than, say, uh, Windows or Mac OS, because uh, those two operating systems tend to constrain you to more recent hardware, because Linux allows us to be to run it on older hardware, that means that I can run a my FileMaker server on really old hardware. If I have a spare box that cannot be used for anything else, well, does that make a good FileMaker server? And, and obviously, if it's just for testing and development, I would say by all means, right? Because it's a cheap way to get a, a, a development server if you don't have one. But for production, not so much. And again, we turn to our Punisher tool. And what we're looking at now is the the aggregate sum of all the tests that we've run on those two, two machines. And we picked two machines that have the same number of cores. Both of these have eight cores, an old MacBook and a recent AWS T3 2X to large instance. So they both have eight cores and the cores run at the same speed as well. So all of these cores run at 2.5 gigahertz. So you would say, well, that's exactly the same speed. And you may expect, or you potentially you could expect the results to come out the same. But they don't, right? You can see that the most recent machine, the T32XLR at, at Amazon, 
is about twice as fast as the old MacBook, even though it has the same number of cores and the same clock speed. The only difference here is the generation, the, the age of the generation of the processors, right? So old hardware, old hardware is old for a reason, right? It's several generations behind what you can get now. And, and by using old, hard, old hardware, you will see the effect and the performance of your solution. So don't fall into that trap. And then of course, there is gonna be some controversy about people wanting to use a desktop on their Linux server. And if you look at the release notes for uh, Tomic Server for Linux, uh, the Ubuntu version, you'll see that Claris actually supports both the server and the desktop version. There is a big caveat there uh, that says that the desktop version is supported but not fully tested. Um, and if you have been on the FileMaker community, um, there already have some people having some issues with running the desktop version. So uh, if you run into issues, uh, again, community is great and we're very friendly. Post your question and we will follow up there. Um, so people will want their desktop because they are used to uh, using operating systems with uh, graphical interfaces like Mac OS and like Windows. Um, and can't really blame people for wanting that, right? It's kind of easy to look at your databases folder on your FileMaker server like this, the way that we look at it on the screen versus having to look at it from a, a terminal that is purely text-based. If you look at, and I just ran the numbers yesterday, if you install a, a fresh Ubuntu and you install FileMaker server on it, if you pick the desktop version, it comes in at about 15 gigs of disk space that it consumes. If you pick the minimal version of, um, of Ubuntu, which is the server, the real server version of Ubuntu, it doesn't have a desktop, it comes in at half of that, at seven gigs, right? And I'm not saying the, the, these relative uh, disk sizes are important because of the disk size that they consume, but they are important for what they mean, right? If we go back to, to the reasons why we would wanna care about installing our FileMaker server on Linux, by using a desktop version, we risk compromising three of those uh, big reasons that we have highlighted, right? Um, the IT departments may expect the server to be headless, uh, to, to not have a desktop, so that they don't have to install remote desktop packages, don't have to deal with that seven gigabytes worth of extra stuff that is installed on that server, needs to ma be maintained, updated, and all of that stuff. So if we as FileMaker developers insist on having a desktop on our Linux server, we risk alienating IT departments. So um, it's, and I'll follow my sword a little bit for that, I think it's more important to learn the skills to administer a FileMaker server for Linux through the command line and using good tools, right? Um, we've had some conversations in the community about that as well. And in some of the resources that I'll uh, highlight at the end of this session, uh, we'll point you to some tools that will take most of the sting away from having or thinking about having to use SSH and the terminal and all of that stuff. So there are really good tools that allow you to administer your FileMaker server without a desktop, and without it feeling a, a lot of pain. Now, the other two reasons are robustness and security. If you have a desktop and you have that seven gigabytes worth of extra stuff, that just increases your attack surface. That's just, that's just a fact, right? So there's more opportunities for your server to get compromised. So by not having a desktop, uh, you have the ability to harden your server uh, and, and remain in the good graces of IT department. So think about that. And if you have questions, by all means, ask them on the community and we'll help you get your server set up and administered uh, so that you feel entirely comfortable. One other important aspect is in that the new admin console for FileMaker Server 19.3 brings back some of the features that we were missing in the admin console. And chief among those is the ability to do a live view of the various logs that FileMaker Server keeps, right? So that was missing has been missing since FileMaker 17. It's back now in 19.3 server. So that's one more reason why you don't need a desktop to just go look at, at your logs. You can look at the logs from any place remotely uh, using the, um, the admin console. I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation there, there that we have four de deployment choices, right? So we have the three operating systems for FileMaker server and we have FileMaker cloud. And there are some functional differences that we have to keep in mind, right? And they're big enough that they may make the decision for you as to what is the best operating system for your, for your solution. Um, it's a bit of a busy, busy slide there that we're looking at. Uh, so I will not go into every single bullet point that we have on there, 
Um, but we can break them down in two big groups um, that we can pay attention to. The first one is integration, right? And that, that, that's the one at the top of uh, the screen that we're looking at there. The FileMaker XML API and the PHP API, and those are the older APIs that FileMaker Server has, those are not supported on Linux. They're not supported on FileMaker Cloud uh, because their FileMaker Server that is part of, of FileMaker Cloud runs on Linux. It's also not uh, available in the FileMaker Linux uh, that you can install uh, yourself. It is still available in the Mac OS and Windows versions, but not on the Linux versions. Uh, the flip side of that, for instance, is that the OData API, and that's a newer API. You have the data API, but you also have the OData API. It's a, it's a great API. We should talk about it more in the community, uh, and perhaps uh, it'll make for a great session at one of the Engage Beyond um, events. The OData API is only available in the Linux version of FileMaker Server, both FileMaker Cloud and, and FileMaker Server for Linux. And then there's a second group there towards the, the second half uh, of that bullet list there that has to do with authentication. Uh, different versions, uh, different deployment options of your FileMaker Server on different operating systems support different authentication options. And that's an important one as well to keep in mind uh, as you consider um, how to build your next FileMaker server and which operating system to pick to install it on. Um, there are also some subtle differences in the admin API um, that you need to take care of. And the community has some great tools around the admin API. Um, if, you, if you're if you not feeling very comfortable about, about creating your own calls to the admin API, there's some great community tools available that you can just download and use. And I've mentioned it a few times, the community is great and the community is full of resources that will get you going. Um, if you go with the most recent version of uh, FileMaker Server, which is 19.3, that one is available only on Ubuntu. Um, there is a, um, a fairly extensive blog post that we have up on, Soliant, on the Soliant Consulting blog that basically recaps all of the stuff that we talked about today, the reasons why um, you would pick Linux, uh, but it has very detailed step-by-step, -step, a complete walkthrough of how to um, install Linux, install FileMaker Server, get your files onto the FileMaker Server, all of that um, in the non-desktop version, because that's my favorite, right? So you can just follow along um, and it'll get your, your, file, your first FileMaker Server for Linux set up completely. And you have the short link uh, right there on the screen uh, and you'll be able to, um, to get that done. If you are still using the 19.1 or 19.2 uh, version of FileMaker Server for Linux, that one only runs on CentOS and will continue to be supported until 19.1 and 19.2 become end of life. Um, there's actually two really good resources uh, available for you there. One is a PDF that is basically the equivalent of that full step-by-step -step walkthrough of how to install FileMaker Server on CentOS 7. Um, that's available on the community website. It's a PDF that you can download. Um, and because it's on the community, you can ask questions and we will follow up on that. The second one is a blog post on Solign uh, Consulting that basically talks you through the process of updating your uh, FileMaker server for Linux. Once you have it installed, there's some maintenance that you will need to do. And if you're still running 19.1, for instance, you need to update to 19.2. How do you go about doing that uh, on Linux? So that's a full-blown set up uh, for you there as well. So um, before I hand it over to questions and answers, um, I, I do want to make one last push for, for talking about the community. The community is great, as I mentioned in the beginning. When I got started, it's how I learned. There are some people that, that helped me through my learning curve, and I'm happy to do that with, uh, with anybody else who has questions on, on Linux. There are some really good threads um, from the past year that talk about the FileMaker server for Linux that you can uh, look at. There's some, there's some really good conversations about the performance differences uh, between FileMaker Server, Linux, Mac, or OS Windows. There's even some really good older conversations from the past year, the past 12 months, on using something like Dockers and containers. Uh, so it's a great, great resource for you to pull apart and look at. Um, and you can find me there, so ask any questions. And with that, I'll hand it over to Janine. Thanks, Wem. Um, and thank you also just for your continued advocacy and being such a great champion for the community as a great resource. Um, we have many questions, uh, no surprise with, with this group, and I'm thrilled to kind of kick that off. But first, I want to welcome in some special guests, as promised. 
We have some additional Claris representation from our product and engineering, te engineering team. So hi, everyone from the Claris teams. It's great to see you. I know that many of our audience members are thrilled, likely to see all of you and hear from you as well. Um, OK, so yes, lots of questions. And as I said, we will get to as many as time allows. And we do have a fair amount of time. So I'll start with a question um, about the choice of Ubuntu. Why the choice for an older version of Ubuntu is the question. Sure. Um, sure. I, I, I will I some of try that. to. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Lucy. All right. So um, we released Spile Maker Server 19.3 on Ubuntu 18.04. When we start the project, Server Ubuntu, uh, we started to look at what's available for Ubuntu OS. So it was 16.04 LTS and 18.04 LTS. 19.04, it's a regular release. 20.04 LTS was not on the market. Ubuntu releases every six months, April and October every year. So long-term release, LTS, long-term uh, service support means every two years they re they release uh, a version. And then LTS is supported five years since its release, and then adding five years of security update and maintenance. Other releases are supported for nine months. So at the time, 1904 was available as regular release, but it's only be supported from April 2019 to March 2020. And 1804 is supported from April 2018 to April 2023 with additional five years of security update to 2028. So 1804 is the uh, latest LTS that we released. And the Ubuntu 1804 does opens up a lot of things. We want to give you, our community, a stable, most powerful Linux OS to run on private cloud, public cloud, and hybrid cloud infrastructure on AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud Platform, and even possibly, you know, Oracle or IBM Cloud, wherever your customers are. So back to you, Jeannie or uh, somebody else wants to jump in. Does anyone else want to add to Lucy or should I move on to another question? I'll take silence as move on. Okay, um, the next question is about when will the Linux version support Ubuntu 20? So I'll take that, uh, Janine. Um, so um, we have done some exploratory testing already on Ubuntu 20, um, and we are aware of some work that would need to be done to, to make it compatible. Um, it's definitely um, on our backlog uh, for support, and I don't yet have a, have a date for exactly when that'll be, um, but uh, definitely in line with what Lucy just talked about what, related to the versions that we chose. Awesome. And I, another one, um, this is about when is OData API coming to Mac OS and Windows? Maybe that's you too, Rick, I'm not sure. Yeah, it is. Um, both of those are currently on our backlog. Um, and currently, there's not, not a date yet determined, um, but definitely uh, on our backlog. Awesome. All right, let's keep rolling. We've got quite a few questions here. Will the Linux version support Active Directory, Directory local accounts in the future? We support ADFS Active Directory Federation services for finding a server on Linux already. Awesome, thank you. Okay, how about will the Linux version support um, XML and PHP API? Uh, so this is me again, Janine. Um, that is not supported on our Linux server. Uh, uh, Wim talked about it a little bit uh, more briefly. Of course, we do support the our RESTful API as well as the OData API, uh, but XML and PHP uh, are not, and we don't have plans for supporting those on our Linux server. Okay. Here's a question about mixing and matching operating systems for WebDirect worker machines. Can that be done? 
Uh, yes, uh, you want a web direct secondary machine can work with web direct primary machine on Windows or Mac and vice versa. Thank you. Thanks, Wade. Okay. Will there be an FMP client on Linux? Can you tell us about how Web Viewer 2 works? I'll, I'll take the first one and then I'll hand uh, the second one over to Clay. But the, as far as FileMaker Pro running on Linux, we currently do not have any plans for that. I'm never going to say never because never is a long time. But um, I would be uh, more interested to hearing any any use cases uh, for, for why folks may want to um, have a Linux version of FileMaker. Of course, it would come at a cost of porting over uh, to Linux um, versus um, machines that are already out there. Um, not currently on our roadmap, um, so um, just curious. Uh, don't get a lot of requests for that. I would be curious to to, to have the use cases. Uh, and then over to you, Clay. Well, one less. Well, I mean, I did start on the port to OS two for FileMaker also, and that didn't go very long either. It's uh, it's not fun porting to new new operating systems. Um, Web Viewer 2, I get a non-Linux question here, but that, that's one of the big features in the last version that we put out is uh, we're on the Windows platform, we're changing the, the Web Viewer. The, 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 in FileMaker, we've been using the operating system to do uh, web containers inside FileMaker. We're using the, the WebKit stuff from Apple, and that could be another whole discussion there because there's multiple versions of the Web Viewer over on the Mac side too. But on the Windows side, um, the, we were using the MFC slash Win32 version of their web viewer, which was based on Internet Explorer. And that's getting deprecated. And, and it, well, I don't think even Microsoft wants to even think about Internet Explorer anymore. So we had to move to the, the a newer version of a web viewer container on the Windows platform. And there's been some others, but they required a completely different architecture to write the application from. And then uh, WebView2 came into view. WebViewer 2 came into view, which was something that we could integrate into FileMaker. Now, it is a very new version, a new API in coming from Microsoft. It's um, still being under act, still under active development. Um, if you go to their website, you'll notice that they're at a cadence of releasing a new version every six weeks right now. And once Microsoft Edge gets to version 94, they're going to be going to a four-week release cycle on it. So that means uh, inside FileMaker, when you're running, you'll probably, you know, any security updates that are coming from Microsoft will uh, be included automatically. Um, but the other thing that WebViewer 2, at this point, um, we're using, we're still having to do some odd tricks to get the same functionality that Internet Explorer supports. Uh, so we're having to actually inject JavaScript into web pages to be able to get things like context menus. Um, now, context menu support is coming in the later version of WebViewer 2 natively, but it's only in the experimental stage. So we're, we're waiting for these release cycles to come out from Microsoft until they start making that official API so we can start taking advantage of it. There's other things like uh, better file handling, better drag and drop support, better, uh, um, I forgot, there's some other things, there's some other APIs that we're really waiting for Microsoft to finish. And we can see them and try them out, but uh, you can go to their Git pages and download a later version of the uh, WebView 2. But it does take a while for them to certify and actually officially release it. And as they release these new APIs, we'll, we'll uh, be updating the, the Windows version to use the latest APIs and use the, the, the proper tools to do the, the same features that we've had in FileMaker and stop trying to inject a, a JavaScript to work around these issues that we currently have. Um, so it is it's going to be consistent development. It's it, WebViewer 2 is not done the work. There's, um, even in the next release, we're, we're finding some other workarounds to get things to work more like the, the previous product does. But it, it's going to be a, a hopefully keep getting better every time we release a new version of uh, FileMaker. No doubt, no doubt. Thanks, Clay. Um, so we have quite a few questions actually about whether or not we'll support FileMaker Server on other Linux versions, including Debian, I hope I'm saying that right, or Rocky Linux. Um, anyone want to take that one? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll start and there may be other panelists, Lucy, others that may want to chime in. So of course there's a lot of flavors of Linux, 
we could have chosen. Of course, we started with CentOS, uh, and um, then, um, as as Wim talked about in in the history, moved on to Ubuntu. Um, and of course, you know, Ubuntu has been around for a while. It is. Um, you know, it is based on um, uh, Debian uh, as well. Uh, and um, again, I, I'm not going to never say never. We'll certainly keep our eye on the space as that evolves. Um, but having multiple Linux flavors uh, comes at a cost internally for, for testing. Uh, and so um, it's, it, we're, we're, we're going to stick to um, uh, Ubuntu for now uh, and keep our eyes open. Uh, I don't know if anyone else on the panel has additional to add there. Seems like a no. <laughs> um, okay, a few more questions. We have a little bit more time, so let me see how many more we can get to. Um, let's see. We have a question here about security. Hold on, I'm trying to find it. <laughs> Give me a second. Uh, yes, it, why installing a desktop um, on Ubuntu server compromises security? Sure, I, I can. I can tackle that for a little bit and then I give it off to, to the panels. Um, I mentioned some of that in the um, in in my presentation, right? It, the, the sheer number of things, um, widgets, uh, applications that get installed, um, because they're available on the machine, uh, they just increase the attack service, right? I'm not saying that every single thing that, that gets installed is insecure by nature, they're not. Um, but it just, it's one more thing that can be uh, used, leveraged, compromised. So if it's not there, it cannot be used in, in any kind of attack. So not having it is more secure than having it. Um, one of the immediate big things, for instance, is the when people install a desktop, they typically want to remote desktop in, right? So if you take a Ubuntu desktop, plain vanilla, like it is, uh, it comes with a remote desktop server called Vino. Um, Vino doesn't work out of the box for remote connections unless the user is already logged in. So it's not a, it doesn't create a new user session, it takes over the user session that's on the server. Uh, on the on the machine itself. So if that ser if that session is not available, you cannot remote desktop in. So what is the next logical step that people will do? They say, well, I'll leave my user logged in on my server so that I can use my Vino remote desktop. And you can see the progression of making decisions that each one individually compromise or potentially compromises security as you go along, right? So um, the fewer things you have on your server, the more secure it is. Awesome, thanks, Wim. Uh, here's a question about, uh, are there any future plans for on-prem hosting of Claris Connect type functionality on Linux or otherwise? Can you repeat that question one more time, Janine? Sure. Are there any future plans for on-prem hosting of Claris Connect type functionality on Linux or otherwise? Yeah, they're asking whether they're going to bring Claris Connect so you could run it locally and stuff like that. Um, I can't no, talk about that one, but what, what Peter was talking about, that whole stack he was talking about, the new stack that we're working on, that's going to be designed to work either uh, locally on your internal or inside your corporation or on the cloud. Um, so future stuff, we're, we're definitely looking at making sure you can run stuff that the, all the future work is going to be able to run wherever you really want it, because we know a lot of people want to do stuff internally and stuff like that. Awesome. Here is a question asking for a recommendation. What would you recommend as an alternative to custom web publishing for Linux? Uh, it's a it's a good question. Uh, first and foremost, I think we still call custom web publishing uh, custom web publishing these days, uh, the because it really meant means something very generic, right? It's basically using FileMaker data in a custom web publishing form, whether you use PHP or .NET or Ruby um, or, or React so with JavaScript, uh, any of those to interact with your users, but using FileMaker as as the database backend, if you will. Um, the data API is the obvious one. Right, because it's it's great. Um, the um, people typically when they say custom web publishing, they mean PHP as the scripting, the web scripting language, um, and then the XML API really was underneath that. 
Uh, so if you if you don't go with the XML API and the PHP, you look at the data API as the mechanism for moving data at, in and out of FileMaker. And then really it's your choice of, um, of web scripting and client browser scripting languages. JavaScript is the big one. Um, so React, uh, Node in the back end. Um, and, and again, community comes to the rescue, right? As soon as the data API was released a couple of years ago, and there's some great pages that aggregates every single community contribution you'll find .NET wrappers around the data API. Uh, you'll find JavaScript wrappers, Ruby wrappers, PHP wrappers even. So if you want to stick with PHP as your favorite web scripting language, you can just basically lift and shift from using the old custom web publishing to the new one and still uh, maintain most of your PHP code. So there's plenty of options. Um, so I would say if you have specific questions, create a thread on community and, and we'll take it from there. And also with Linux, you have the choice of OData as another REST API, which is a more standard one. So I, I haven't really gone out there to look. There, there probably are tools out there to you know, quickly develop websites using the OData standard. Because uh, uh, the FileMaker Data API is a FileMaker specific REST API, but OData tries to follow. I, I think we did a much better job of following the standard with OData than we did like with XML and some of the other technologies that we have. So I would really recommend taking a look into that. And I think there was another question about where are the OData docs? And I'm pretty sure, I'll make sure you get, have Rosemary put the, put up the links to that, that we have for that too, but we'll, we'll make sure we post that. Awesome. I think we have time for one more question. Probably we we're just coming up here on the end of our session. Here's a question about those who are familiar with installing server on Mac OS and windows. But in brief, what is the process for installing FileMaker Server on Ubuntu? Um, I can take that one. Um, those resources that were at the tail end of my presentation have that full step-by-step -step walkthrough, right? So if you've never done it before, if you never touched uh, Ubuntu Linux before, um, just go to that blog post that you'll find short linked, and we'll put the links on on community. Um, basically, just follow it. It'll take your hand and it'll walk you through it. And by the end of uh, of that that walkthrough, you'll have a fully functional FileMaker server on on Ubuntu. Fantastic. Well, um, I want to thank Wim and our panelists of uh, Claris team members for joining us and committing your time to today's session. It's really informative. And, and for those of you that don't know, I'm not all that technical, but I'm learning a lot just listening to all of you. So I do appreciate, appreciate your input and your insights very much. Um, this will conclude our session for today. Again, please engage in the discussion that we've dedicated to the session on community moving forward. And um, don't hesitate to share your feedback by completing the survey. Those links are available in the chat. And also join us for future events. The registration page on claris.com has been updated. There are many more sessions and many more to come. We hope to see you at a future session. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you again soon.